first, I'd, I just want to say uh, Harold Van Ness was the person who was going to give this presentation, but he's out of town and uh, uh, had a prior commitment, so he couldn't make it. And I just want to thank uh, Bianca and Shai. They both contributed to, to this presentation. Um, so ADAPTN it relates to part of what Todd had presented earlier in that it is a tool for, for making nitrogen recommendations for, and specifically for corn. And so, um, so uh, before getting into the slide, I'll just give you a bit of history on the tool. It was, um, came out of actually a large amount of research that's shown the impact of weather on, on nitrogen and availability for, um, for, for crop production. Um, and so part of that work was, has been done at Cornell, part of it done by Harold's lab. And, and about 10 years ago, we decided, well, can we develop a tool to try to estimate the impact of weather on soil nitrogen availability in the spring and adjust recommendations based on that? And so we began developing this tool, and it was a combination of a dynamic simulation model, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And in weather for uh, uh, um, uh, data, and developed an interface for it. And over the past ten years or so, we we um, uh, built it and expanded it from New York State, and actually went into the Midwest. A couple of years ago, that was uh, the tool was actually licensed and and commercialized by Agronomic Technology Corporation. And so, what this is right here. It's just a kind of a, 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 a pr promotion or a, a kind of a flyer for, for the tool developed by agronomic technology. But I just wanted to focus on the, the kind of things that we're I'm going to be talking about are that is field specific and it adjusts to weather, soil, and practices, and particularly to weather. So the, these are all related to the ability to use climate data to make better predictions for soil nitrogen for corn. And you can see from the, all the, the logos here, there's a lot, a lot of interest in better nitrogen management in corn. And these are a, a bunch of both nonprofit and for-profit entities that have been supportive of this kind of work. So because I work on the model, um, not necessarily related to ADAPT, I work on the model that's used by ADAPT, and although the, my work's not necessarily related to ADAPT and at this point, I am required to give this disclosure, so just so you know. So what are the concerns, what are kind of the reasons that led us to this, um, to develop this sort of thing are, first of all, corn is the major user of nitrogen fertilizer in this country, and the efficiency of that use is very low, relatively speaking, and I think Todd talked a bit about that, about, you know, trying to increase that efficiency, and that is our goal. There's a lot of uncertainty about what's the appropriate level to use, and it's very sensitive to weather, and in, in kind of falling on that, it'll be sensitive to variability in weather that will be brought on as a result of climate change. So, the, so there's agronomic and economic incentives to improve that, and then the, the environmental consequences of bad nitrogen management basically are increased greenhouse gas emissions and increased nitrate leaching. So what, we're, what a priority is for us in New York State at the time we were developing this tool is to try to improve that efficiency and this is what led to the development of this tool. And part of that meant trying to use weather information to improve that. that that efficiency of use. Oops. So just to I'll touch on a, a couple of the environmental consequences, you show two major estuary, river estuary systems in the United States, Chesapeake Bay estuary or river system, Susquehanna, and then the Mississippi River Basin. In both of those cases, there's a lot of non-point source, sources of nitrogen that are resulting in this, in this, the high loads in these uh, estuaries. A lot of that's from agriculture, and a lot of it's from corn production. In the Northeast, in the Chesapeake Bay, a lot of that's related to the dairy industry because of the high manure application rates. 
in the Midwest, it's much more related to grain corn production. With the greenhouse gas emissions, agriculture is not, it is a significant player. It's not, it's uh, not a huge amount, but it is significant. All again, a lot of that greenhouse gas emission related to agriculture is due to nitrous oxide, and that is from nitrogen fertilizer applications to, to corn. And you can see on the map on the right, the red is high, relatively higher greenhouse gas emissions, or yellow, orange to red. So the Midwest, as you might expect, is very high. But New York State is, is significant, although not as high. And just kind of an interestingly, Walmart, one of the supporters of this effort, um, became a supporter because they did an analysis of the foot, carbon footprint in their supply chain. And I think it was quite surprising to them that they have all these components, but the biggest component by far was fertilizer applied to, to corn. So that was, uh, I think, opened their eyes a bit and kind of led to more interest in, in supporting tools like ADAPT-M. So what are the challenges in developing this kind of thing? There's the challenges, and I, I think, again, Todd touched on this in, in the talk before, there's a lot of components to the system that can affect nitrogen availability. The ones we're particularly we're interested in is the weather, and particularly temperature, but also precipitation. It's trying to 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 develop to better understand the impact of these on soil nitrogen availability of corn that that really drove uh, a lot of the work that we're that we were interested in, in doing to try to improve efficiency. The kind of key thing to understand is that these these. The interaction among these different components are complex, nonlinear, and dynamic. So because of, and because of that, the generalized recommendations just don't, don't, don't do very well. So, and, but also because they're complex, nonlinear, and dynamic, we decided to approach this 10 years or so ago by using a dynamic simulation model, which was kind of different from what the other approaches have been to nitrogen management in corn. And so um, the advantages of using a model, a dynamic simulation model, is that we can mathematically represent the processes that, you know, uh, that, that are involved with these different components. We can link them together, and we can look at how they change over time. And what we're particularly interested in is how's, how does soil nitrogen changing over, over time and crop available nitrogen changing over time. So the, th the kind of basis for this tool is this dynamic simulation model combined with other things. So why are we interested, and, and Toby may have more insight, does have more insight into this than I do, but, you know, weather is changing, and we're seeing more heavy precipitation events. And for what it's worth, I don't know how much uncertainty there is in this, but they're projecting changes in precipitation. I don't know if this is real or not, but I think and Toby again can talk uh, about this. Whatever happens, it's going to change. <laughs> so, so there is going to be this continue to be variability, and and the question is how can we manage our nitrogen to account for that variability? So now I'm just going to go through a, a number of slides just showing the man, the the tool itself, um, and I'll go through these fairly quickly. So these are the kind of things that, uh, that ADAPT-N tries to address. And it can be grouped into three kind of categories. One is, what's the recommendation that the tool has for, for nitrogen in a given season, in a given field? What's the kind of system doing? So what's happening to soil nitrogen? What's happening to the uptake by the crop? What, what do we expect will happen as the season progresses? And then, a kind of last set of uh, group would be how can we use, retrospectively use the tool to say, well, what worked and what didn't work, and particularly in the previous year, and try to gain some insight from that in terms of making decisions in the, in the current year. So I said, built on this kind of dynamic simulation model, of course, 
The other key inputs are the user inputs, but in particular, I want to focus on the high resolution climate data because it was, or weather data. That was really the thing that allowed us to take the tool from a, from a kind of a generalized regional application to a field specific application. And um, that is, was developed uh, by Art Digitano and the Northeast Regional Climate Center. And it kind of allowed us to, 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 to move this tool to a very kind of focused, field specific, uh, specific um, uh, application. And please, any question, please, please ask along the way. So the, so the kind of the, the way it operates is you, you, you have a location and you have to input that location and these are kind of ways that you can do that. Um, it could be a field, it could be a group of fields, or it could be a zone within a field. Um, then once you've entered the location information, uh, you can give it a name, you can estimate how, how large it is, and then you start entering the data that are necessary to actually initialize the model, provide the input parameters, and then, and then allow the model to run. So those would be soil information, and we have a large number of what we call soil dictionaries. They're soil input files for a whole range of locations across the eastern U.S. And so you select your soil type or your soil texture. That gets uploaded into the, into the model. Tillage, various tillage options. If you pick conservation tillage, then you select an amount of residue on the surface. And these are all important items that are used in terms of calculating how much nitrogen will ultimately be recommended by the tool. Uh, soil test information, this is quite important, particularly soil organic matter. Um, crop information, maturity class of the crop. In this case, it's a grain crop, but we also have silage corn, for which would be more appropriate in the case of uh, most dairy operations. You have to provide an expected yield, and this kind of reflects, again, somewhat what Todd showed with the Pioneer um, tool, or similar sort of product, where you have to set a yield goal, more or less. A planting date, the expected harvest population, and then what was the previous crop. <coughs> then you enter whatever nitrogen applications have been already done on, the, on that field or that zone. Um, whether it's pre-plant, if you apply pre-plant fertilizer, the date of the application, the um, a type of fertilizer that was applied, the amount, and then the depth. And this, again, kind of relates back to what Todd mentioned about placement and the importance of placement. I should say that for we have the similar kind of procedures are followed for manure or sod. Um, and this would apply more to dairy systems, silage systems, so that in the except that in those cases, you, you're asked to look back two years because of the persistence of manure and sod in the system and the mineralization from that, from those uh, inputs. But again, a similar sort of procedure where you have to provide some information on what those input, inputs were. Then there's a, the, the model runs, and then you get the output. And so the key thing that most people are initially interested in, of course, is a recommendation for that field or that zone. We provide some degree of variability around that, that number based on what we project to be the future mineralization and losses. And that's a whole procedure in itself. But it provides us with a kind of range um, depending on what the year will be. Um, and that's where, getting back to what Toby talked about, about providing some sort of um, projection a month or two ahead, it'll allow a grower to decide, well, do they want to go to the low end or the high end of that, of that, um, of that range? Um, so that's where the more long-term forecast would be actually very useful and to provide some degree of uh, uh, or some idea of what the uncertainty is in that, that projection. 
It provides a lot of information on the system based on the model output, including you know, input data that, that was provided, but also what's the expected future mineralization from the organic sources in the soil? How much is currently in the top 12 inches or top 30 centimeters? How much has been taken up by the crop, et cetera? So this gives information to the user about the system that, that they have, which they might find very useful or, or um, uh, be able to um, use that in the future for better nitrogen management. It provides graphs of the output. Um, in this case, we're looking at um, uh, leaching losses over time, uh, gaseous losses from denitrification, and then precip. And so you can get a kind of a graphical sense of what's happening in the system in the field or the zone that you're, you're interested in. They have instituted this variable rate recommendation um, capability. And so what that means that you can do, uh, I think the grid size that they allow is about 20 meters by 20 meters, or 60 feet by 60 feet about. And if you can provide, let's say, or you know, running a tool like the Varus tool that was described, uh, Todd described, or that other sampler to try to get at how does organic matter vary over your field, you can you know, develop a grid based on the, those organic matter estimates, and then that could be used to develop a kind of a variable rate, oops, sorry, a variable rate that um, for an individual grids, and, and there are uh, capabilities on, as, as was mentioned with the equipment now, to, to apply, for example, nitrogen on a gridded uh, or variable rate um, manner. The new features are this, that they've instituted this past year are the in integration with AgEx platform. It's a tool that um, um, kind of um, uh, uh, uses uh, or puts together a large amount of spatial information that you might have on your farm and it allows you to integrate that into tools like AdaptEnt so it'll allow for uh, variable rate applications. Um, that's kind of, sh oops, sorry, <laughs> that's kind of shown here using these um, different sources of information. They do have a new uh, ability to account for controlled release products, uh, ureas, as well as uh, urease and nitrification inhibitors, uh, stabilizers I think is what uh, Todd described them as. Uh, so there's a ability to um, input that and account for that in the recommendation. In the future, they're looking for to expand it to do an irrigation scheduler. There's a op, um, option to, uh, or a, they're going to introduce the ability to, to account for cover crops, and then they're also working on a version for wheat. This just shows the sponsors for a lot of the work um, on ADAPTN. USDA has been the long-term kind of uh, source of funds for this work. Um, it is uh, every year there is a series of strip trials that are put out to test and validate, check the validation of this tool. It's been going on for five years now, and it's, it's done perform quite well in most years and in most locations. It covers the Midwest as well as, as the Northeast, the strip trials do. And so uh, I think it's in now 26 states that they have, um, their, they have clients that are using this tool. So um, again, uh, the, the, the kind of fundamental driver for all this was the, the idea that weather is critical for making decisions about nitrogen application in corn and how can we use that information and make better recommendations. And Is that's they're not so they're not really using forecast data. There was one yeah, well it, they have the ability to look they'll only go 
this kind of gets to the question of how far ahead can you go. So they will look three days ahead and say, what's the expected, what's the forecast three days ahead? And they'll, they'll, my understanding is that that information will be provided to the user to say, if you are planning on applying in the next three days, you should expect this amount of precipitation. You may not want to do it at that point. The, that comes from the Northeast Regional Climate Center. Now, I'm not, Toby may know. Uh-huh, okay. But it's, again, very limited what they'll provide because of the uncertainty. That but it didn't affect this today, right? Predicted loss through this day. This is like a pop-up for you. That's right. It just tells you, do you want to do this, man? You know, do you want to apply, for example, in the next three? It doesn't affect what the, the model is predicting to be losses. No. That's just climatology, it's, yes. And, that, and for projections of losses, for example, that's based on multiple simulations that were done using average climate data for different locations and then looking at, well, what on average were the losses so for if different drought, that might not be That's right. So if there's a drought, for example, then that's there, we, we can't predict that. And you, the, the, uh, you, you can't, it wouldn't be accounted for. So that's where the tool is limited in its applicability. Yep. But in this region, I would say, look, in my lab, it's usually better than that cell in the outside. Yeah. That was what, that's what Art keeps telling me. <laughs> <laughs> so I believe it. <laughs> so any other questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah. That is actually what this, and I should have mentioned that, that is what this tool was originally designed for, was split applications. So everything, we are always, were, the idea was you were, we were interested in within season applications. The reason for that is that the impact of early season weather is on that pool of soil nitrogen, crop available soil nitrogen. And what we were finding from the research is that it was that pool that was being affected by that early season weather. It was, so the ideal scenario is to do a split application where you don't apply much at the beginning of the of that planting, and then you allow some period of time, you try to go in as late as possible where you can still get equipment in the field to allow for um, changes in that pool as a result of the weather to be to be manifested, and then get to a point in the growth of the crop where essentially the, the amount of water being used by the crop is sufficient so you don't get those very high leaching and denitrification losses. So it's kind of a stabilized. That's the point at which ideally the tool should be used. So from that point on, we're basically looking at not large denitrification or leaching losses, but mainly Law, uh, uptake by the crop. And so you get a better, uh, the recommendation becomes more and more, um, let's say, accurate or, be or more precise as you move further into the growing season. The limitation there is when can you get equipment in the field, first of all, to apply that extra nitrogen. And second of all, is there some point beyond which, you know, you've missed your opportunity to, to uh, apply nitrogen and allow, have the crop be able to take it up sufficiently so you get a, you know, kind of, kind of maximize your yield. So I should have emphasized that at the beginning, but it's, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs>